In the first church that I served, there was a man who had an operation on his heart, and in the midst of that, uh, he died for a few minutes on the operating table. I've undoubtedly talked about him before because his story was so amazing. In the midst of that, Jesus came to him and said, I am going to make you whole again. And then he came back to this world. Many of us know someone like this, right, who's had a, what we call a near-death experience, although near-death seems strange because they have died and yet they come back from death. We hear stories like this in books like Heaven is for Real, which is about a little boy who had an experience where he died for a period of time and then came back to life. We hear stories of people who see a light and go toward the light, but at some point before going completely toward that light, they are told to turn around or they choose to turn around. And we hear later that these are moments when they died for a period of time and then came back to life. We're familiar with near-death experiences. And even if we haven't experienced something as dramatic as that, even if we don't know someone who's had that kind of experience, we certainly know people who have talked about having the experience of having a new lease on life, right? After having a joint replaced, it can feel like a new lease on life as we learn how to move more freely again without pain. Or maybe there's a new relationship after the ending of a previous one, and that can feel like a new lease on life. Or some other big change, maybe a new job after a job that we detested. It can feel like a new lease on life. All of those things can feel like new life, even though they aren't the exact dramatic kind of new life that the people that have near-death experiences have. Today's story, of course, is much more like the first kind. This girl has died, and her father comes to Jesus and says, I know that if you can just put, lay your hand on her, she will live again. And Jesus goes with the man, and sure enough, he lays his hand on the girl, and she gets up, and she lives again. We're doing this series on miracles, and this is indeed a miracle, new life out of death. And it, of course, points to a larger reality for us as Christians, which is that Belief in life after death is at the core of who we are. We, have call, of course, call it resurrection, as Carrie talked about. And she mentioned that we're waiting for that celebration at Easter. And as I prepared for this sermon, a colleague told me this week, well, what you have to do is preach sort of a mini Easter sermon because there's no way to talk about this miracle of, new, of life out of death without addressing the resurrection miracle we have to think of resurrection when we think about this miracle of this girl being brought back from death to life. And, we, and resurrection is who we are. Do you know that United Methodists don't do funerals? We have a name for our services. And it's an important distinction because although I do kind of like the word funeral, because I like to tell people that I try to put the fun in funeral, right? No? Yeah? It's a good and important distinction for us, because actually the word funeral comes from the Latin for the word that means dead body. And so a funeral only deals with the death. But in the United Methodist Church, do you know what we call our services? We call them a service of death and resurrection. We can't simply do a funeral. We can't simply stop at death. We have to always, as Christians, acknowledge the resurrection. There is no simple celebration of death because we are people of resurrection. We're people that know that Jesus did these miracles in the Bible of bringing people back to life and that he continues to bring people back from the dead and that most importantly, one day he will take each and every one of us by hand and say, get up and we will live again. And this story points to that. And of course, I've told you, if you've ever taken a class with me, 
how much I love scripture because every time I read it, I notice something new. And you, notice, you know what I noticed this week? I noticed that this father is so confident that Jesus can bring new life for his daughter that he leaves her funeral. Her funeral is already going on. That's what we discover. You, you have to sort of understand Jesus' culture, but what happens is he goes and gets Jesus, and he brings Jesus back, and Jesus complains because it's so noisy, and there are people playing flutes. And this is two things. In Jesus' time, you always hired people to wail at a funeral. I really think we should bring this back. I love this idea of paying people to cry for us. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I, it's sort of laughable in some ways, but I'm also being serious because as a culture, we struggle to cry, right? I think it might be useful to hire people to cry for us because we seem to be unable to do it sometimes. We feel like we've got to keep this stiff upper lip, right, and, and, and be under control, and we can't let the grief get to us. Maybe we should pay somebody to do it for us. They always would hire people to wail, so that's why it says Jesus was upset with all the noisy people. There are people wailing there. And then you also hired people to play the flute for the funeral. And it, and it says that there were all these people making noise and playing flutes. We know that there's a funeral going on. This is what you did for a funeral. And this is fascinating. It means the funeral's already going on, but where was the dad? He was not at the funeral. He was over seeking out Jesus because he believed so deeply that Jesus could bring new life in the midst of just a funeral, just the dead body. He believed in death and resurrection. He believed in new life. Are we willing to leave behind death to pursue new life? Do we truly believe that Jesus can bring new life? I've said already that we've all experienced it in some way. Again, almost all of us know someone who's had a near-death experience. And yet we seem so in love with death. And we're surrounded by it. We were surrounded by death again this week as another act of violence happened in our midst at Michigan State. And we seem to love death because we don't seem to be able to do anything to change it. Even though, when we poll people, the vast majority of Americans support trying to do something about it. Specifically, while people are very divided on whether we should have stricter gun laws, a majority, an overwhelming majority of Americans believe that we could have better background checks. In fact, even gun owners overwhelmingly support this idea of having better background checks. And yet, it seems to me sometimes that we'd rather attend another funeral than to see the possibility that new life might come out of trying to make a change. And it's complicated by the fact that when they poll people and they overwhelmingly say they would support a stricter background check, when they then ask them if they think that that would stop these mass acts of violence, the response is much lower. It's only like 40% of people who think this would actually make a difference. And so that's hard, right? We sort of wonder why we do it. But here's why we might do it, which is that it might help. It might stop death. Isn't it worth a try? And I know that you may be thinking that your pastor is no longer talking about mir miracles, and you know, I've gotten into politics, and we should keep politics out of the pul pulpit, but here's the thing I realized. Don't you think it would take a miracle at this point to solve this issue? It seems like it would to me, because it happens again and again and again, and we gather together and we grieve, and then we do nothing to step away from the death and the funeral. We need to be more like this father who today says, I'm not even going to attend my daughter's funeral because I believe that Jesus can bring her life. Solving the issue of violence in our country seems simple, and yet 
it would take a miracle. And that's exactly what this man experiences. In some senses, what he asks is simple. Jesus, just touch my daughter. And yet it's the miracle that he needs, and she is dead, and she lives again. And we are meant to understand there was a period of time uh, in the early church where uh, we took the Bible uh, very literally here, and people said, well, Jesus says she's only sleeping, right? And so all he does is wakes her up. It's not an actual uh, experience of death. But of course, we know that that's ridiculous because we all know the difference between a sleeping person and a dead person, right? You look for signs, and they breathe, and they have a pulse, and things like that. Jesus is, of course, speaking not in a literal way, but he's encouraging them not to get caught up in death and to realize that he has the power of life. And so he uses this euphemism that he says she's just sleeping. And he brings her back from the dead. She is truly dead, and we are told that. And in fact, the people are so sure of it that when Jesus says she's only sleeping, they laugh at him. What are you talking about? Of course she's dead. And then Jesus brings new life. He can restore her, and he can restore each and every one of us. We have had experiences like this one, where this girl comes back from death, and we've also experienced new life in a lot of other ways. As I mentioned before, new relationships and new jobs and new commitments and At the same time that we experienced death this week at MSU, we experienced new life. As I'm sure you've heard by now, there's a revival going on at Asbury College in Kentucky. And this is an experience of new life. These are people recommitting themselves or committing themselves for the very first time to follow Jesus Christ and to seek after the new life that he brings. Because that's who we are. We're a people of new life. We have to be willing to walk away from death, to walk away from the funeral. We have to be willing to walk away from the things that are trying to kill us physically as well as spiritually. Things like sin and addiction. You have to walk away from death and walk to new life in Jesus. And then, We need to be ready to share our stories of life. That's what this whole year has been about, is sharing our faith in Jesus Christ with other people. And so we've encouraged you to do that throughout this series, to write miracles on butterflies and to share blessings last week with others by folding butterflies. And today, on the tables in the back, you'll have a sheet. I wanted this one to be the largest butterfly, and so it's an entire coloring sheet of a butterfly. We'll have uh, crayons and markers that you can color with, and you can color in a butterfly, but I also want you to share a story of new life on there. And you can either post it for people to see here at church or take it with you and give it to someone because we are meant to be people who share the stories of new life with other people. We are meant to be people who point to Jesus and to point to all of these things in life that make new life possible. And we're meant to experience miracles both big and small on the daily. And we are meant to be people that Jesus can share these stories through and who point to the light and walk in the resurrection life available through Jesus Christ. I don't want to be people of death anymore. I want to be people of life. And so Jesus has a phrase he uses in other places where he raises people up. What we're told here today in this story is simply that the girl got up, but sometimes Jesus says to the person, get up. That's what I want to say to you today too, is that I want you to get up and go and live in Jesus. Amen.